What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Elephant in the Room podcast. This is your boy, RCR Mooley Main. This in the Elephant in the Room podcast is the place for Alabama hoops, basketball, anything involving Crimson Tide basketball. So I'm happy that you guys have joined in. And uh, I want I want to first say I apologize because it's been a while since I uploaded my last video. And I've been trying to make sure I'm I don't stumble too much when I tie when I when I make these episodes and I recorded a bunch of them but I still keep stumbling up and getting lost and stuff so maybe I just need to type out like a full essay or something like word for word what I need to do but but now it's like we're 20 hours away from the NBA draft and I want to talk about Keon Ellis and uh this so I just I'm just going to put something out there I do apologize for if it is like a little like um, if I do if I do like trip up a bit as I speak, but I truly believe that I'm delivering good material and worth worthy material for your time, and I'll do my best to keep it within and with underneath fifteen minutes. It's gonna be like that. So I really appreciate it, guys, uh, and just you know just bear with me. New content will keep coming out. So yeah, Keon Ellis has fallen off of a lot of draft boards. I started noticing this as because I do check like periodically from time to time. And then just out of nowhere, one, it was like around two weeks ago, I think, where he just fell off the draft boards, a lot of draft boards completely. And this, this really like threw me off because for one, throughout the entire season, uh, even, even for most of the off season, Keon Ellis seemed like a bona fide, like surefire, gonna get drafted top, gonna get drafted within 58 slots like he was gonna get drafted most likely but now most mock drafts are not having him being drafted and this is this is especially crazy because no matter despite what was going on through the Alabama season throughout their ups and downs Keon was seeming like a top 45 pick throughout a lot of it they were they were even Time, there were even a couple websites saying he could be like a potential late first first round pick and i'm talking about espn's multiple mock drafts where it was like jonathan javini i think that's how you pronounce the name um and there's also other writers they have and then they also have the they have the best available for the draft that they always keep updated and keon was always within the top 60 uh nba draft was always high on him keeping him in the top 50 but then he slipped out of there and and now I'm just looking here and seeing like it's it's even like Yahoo and stuff. Tankathon Tankathon actually had him in, in the was the website that had him in the first round. But a lot of these websites that had that had Keon Ellis getting draft drafted now he's not getting drafted in their mock drafts. And and the only one I'm really seeing is two four seven or like just some random ones that I've seen on a. Twitter that I'm not too sure how official they are, but I know there are a lot of good good uh, NBA draft uh, cr- content creators out there and writers. So I'm not too sure. I just know like kind of the, the mainstream ones, but I did a little bit of digging and I started to realize why that's the case. But before I get into the case, I'm going to take like a few minutes to just break down his game. And not 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 even gonna be too many minutes, but just gonna break down his game, what I like, what I don't like, how it's gonna translate, and what I see for him going forward. So, yeah, for for one of the thing the thing about Keon Ellis is, uh, he he's not necessarily the most like the top fifth top fifty most talented players in the draft. I mean, I think depending on who you ask, by what you mean by talent. There are other guy. There are other guys who excel in a lot of other areas, but the the thing that made Keon Ellis such a surefire pick for most of the time was he is a three and D player, and his game easily tr- is translatable to the modern NBA. He's a guy that can come out and shoot threes, and he shot thirty six around thirty six percent at Alabama on high volume, which which led the team percentage wise, and. And that's really good considering the the struggles the offense had, and I even say that, and I'll even go to say that part of the part of his struggles, part of it was definitely on him, 
especially like when especially near the beginning of his a cold streak in like november i want to say when he started like late november december more more december excuse me (laughs) that i want to say that was a lot more on him but as as time goes on i started to realize not just him but everyone as a result because of the way alabama's offense was struggling and stuff it became harder to shoot threes and also the spacing was getting bad and and players were just not in the flow and were feeling a lot more hesitant to shoot threes and and i do think in a different system he'll be even a better three-point shooter and and also he's a sec first first team defender Keon Keon flashed a lot of great defensive plays, which we all expected. Now, coming into this season, I had extremely high hopes for Keon. Um, it was to the point where I was thinking that he could be bo- borderline Herb Jones level on ball defense. Of course, Herb Jones' defensive IQ and his and his ability to bring help it just clearly beats Keon. I wasn't expecting to be like that. But I, but I was saying that I was thinking that he could probably be almost as good as Herb Jones on the ball. Now, of course, on ball defense. Now, of course, that didn't happen. Uh, Keon had a decent amount of struggles throughout the season, and uh, one of the main one of the main reason and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because last season, I'll I'll say last season like 2020 2021 versus 21 and to 22. So in 2020, 2021, Keon, Keon actually led the team and like on ball like opponent field goal percentage I think for like on as an on ball de- defender. I think he led her by like 0.3%, which was which was astonishing. And I saw a lot of defensive clips that made me think, okay, this guy is going to be be great. And one thing I noticed the difference between Keon's junior year to Keon's senior year and was at least for a decent amount of games I saw, maybe it wasn't for every single game or all the possessions. So correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I definitely saw a sizable amount of possessions where Keon was playing more like, how do I say, more like a traditional wing wing defender. And when I, when I say when I say more like traditional wing defense, I mean like he gets deep in stance, he gets around like like arm length apart, at least like arm length apart from his from his from the guy he's defending. So he has so he gives them like a, a feet or two, a couple of feet of space, more and just enough to where like he's got long enough arms to like jump up and contest it slightly. If if the if the guy ends up going for a shot, but it was more focused on making sure you cut off the the your opposing guy from driving to the to the lane, and then I would say like it is if uh, for if you want to see like what I mean by that, like go look at like for example like Kobe or like MJ, like the way they defend, they get really deep in their stance, give up a couple of feet. But they're they're really making sure like you got nowhere to you cannot go to the rim. They're not gonna allow you to go to the rim. And they're still have a, enough length to be able to contest you if you were to go f- for a jump shot. Now, Keon I, I saw this season as compared to last season, he plays more of like a more modern wing or like more of a I won't even say wing. I would say a guard, like a one or two guard defender. And how that is is like someone like a like a Drew Holiday or a Matisse Thybul for for example is what Drew, is like the type of defense where Drew Holiday got really popular from where it's like he now he's playing like very suffocating like man defense when he's like getting up in their shooting space getting up in their space like like almost chest to chest kind of closeness which allows which allows the the opposing player to have a driving lane. However, however, where where Keon, where like especially Drew Holiday and Matisse thrive on is recovery, where they'll where they're they're intentionally letting them dr- have a path to drive to the lane, but then they're still fast enough and quick enough on their feet laterally, to where they can go, and then so they they can just they can just turn they can either like sh- shuffle their feet and get 
and still keep up with the guy or just literally just turn around and run and hound the guy at the rim when when at the rim to make them shoot like a forced like uneasy layup and it's mainly it, the whole thing is like like just trying to push them towards the rim and then fo- and then you recover fast enough to where you force your the opposing player to throw up like a wild shot uh and that's what Keon and that's like the kind of defense Keon was playing a lot this year from what I saw and he definitely struggled from that where he would let where obviously where it's like the the drawback is if you let the guy blow by and you're not able to recover fast enough and there's one game I want to say this was near the end I want to say it was near the end of like the like the like right before a conference play where Keon was really struggling with with one with this one dude I'm forgetting the team it was against but uh this guy was like really good at getting to the rim. He was like a big. He was like a small guard, but he was like big, he was pretty fast and pretty strong, and and he was good at getting to the rim. But he was a bad shooter, and Keon was going up and picking this guy like ten feet away from the three point line, and he was doing that continually. Like this guy scored like he must have scored like twenty points on Keon that day. It it, would, it felt like twenty. It was probably like ten, fifteen, but it felt it felt like at least fifteen where he got on Keon, and Keon kept doing that, and it's like, okay, I get, and I, I get that you might be wanting to, like, show off, to like, NBA scouts and stuff, but, like, in this instance, there was no reason to guard the guy like that, you'd rather just let him, you'd rather just slightly contest the shooter, and give up, and give him a few feet, than allow him to have a driving lane, though, though at the same time, like, maybe he was really trying to show, maybe he was really just trying to improve his game, and really just focus on making sure that he can play that way against anyone, you know, and be ready for the next level. Because as the season progressed, his def- his defense kept getting better. And also his three-point shooting was getting m- much better. And I know a lot of Alabama fans are going to can remember the Kentucky game, but also against Notre Dame, he hit a couple of, he hit a couple of nice threes and stuff. His three point shooting along with Javon Quinterly's got better near the end of the season, which makes it even more frustrating that they lost, that they've ended the season on five losses, but that's me digressing. But yeah, he, he, he was showing a lot of great potential in the, in, in those, in that final stretch of games being not only just a catch and sh- catch and shoot player, but also he would go off the dribble and shoot threes and and he would do like little dribble moves and stuff to get to get players to hesitate for a second so he could be able to go up and shoot keon also has because of his long wingspan he he's also able to get his shot off a lot easier than most players so like he's able to get he's able to shoot off the dribble and still make threes as, as well as being a really good catch and shoot and mainly being a catch and shoot three point shooter so that's why it's still surprising to me that he fall he's fallen off of draft boards but and but you know everything i said about the three point shooting i'm just going to go back to the defense one more time where he, his defense really just was just polished i know i'm sure there is like plenty there's clips of him getting like scored on and stuff but damn near every play felt like he was playing great defense and sometimes it was just more of better offense than than good defense so i i really i really enjoy watching him play defense he he he's a very a disciplined defender he's good at he's good at getting rebounds when he when he gets when he's locked in i can talk about that later but he's very disciplined. He doesn't jump or fall for it. He has a pretty good steal rate. I don't remember the number, but a lot of scouts have have mentioned it, so I'm pretty sure you can find that number easily. But he's really good at just making sure he gets his arms in and get a steal or just poke the ball out, which is what made Drew Holiday such like such a big de- such a big name defender is in his recovery. He's able to make sure he can just hound ball handlers and just force them to turn over the ball. So he's a good defend. So not only that, he's also very good at going up for contesting shooters. He doesn't miss time. He always times it very well and stuff. And he's just, and because he's such a good, uh, he's so disciplined on his feet because he's very light footed. 
And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm taking the time to really talk about this is because against a lot of like very skilled ball handlers or just like shot creators, for example, mid-range shooters, he doesn't he doesn't fall for a lot of their dribble jab or like just or just crossover but between the leg kind of moves, whatever you want to call it. Uh, a lot of jabs, he doesn't really he doesn't really uh, fall for that. And even if he moves a little bit, he's so light on his feet that he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't necessarily turn until he sees the defender. The defender start really attacking and driving, and he still has good enough recovery speed to to come back and still contest at the rim. So yeah, he, I really like I, I really do like his defense. Um, I really think that's going to translate and it's going to be something. He's going to be a pretty decent defender day one, I believe, if he were to get drafted into the NBA. But yeah, I could. Uh, there was there were a bunch of more points I wanted to go over, but I was thinking of doing that for another video. But you got you guys let me know. If if I sh if you want to hear that, I know it's getting close to the draft, but I might as well record it anyway. But now we're going on to what's keeping Keon out of the draft, and it's that in his combine he measured in at six three and a half without shoes, and six four and three quarters with shoes. That's a big concern, combined with the fact that he weighed weighed in at one sixty seven. So Keon is has the weight of a five nine average adult and he and he's shorter than the 66 uh thing that he that he's been touted for such a long time because if you go through a lot of these scouting videos and a lot of people are really huge on him being this big wing oh he's 66 he's this really big wing but you know when you're on, now that we're seeing that he's under 65 with shoes on now it's becoming a much more of a concern moving forward so it's like okay do I really want to? Do I really want to bet on someone who's pretty much six four, and not six six? Like he's like there's going to be plenty of players still taller than him. Not to mention, not to mention, uh, three point struggles was a, was a problem. But I will say his his wingspan was still came in pretty well, which was a six eight and a half I believe, off the top of my head. So he still has a pretty nice lengthy wingspan, but. But the height and the weight is really concerning players, scouts, I should say, and GMs now. And all and the other thing is, he has he has no potential, no ability, nor ability to be really a ball handler or a shot creator. I know it's I know it's crazy to say no potential. You 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 never know what's gonna happen, but that's just how scouts evaluate. They don't see the potential there. Doesn't mean he doesn't have it, but we just don't. You don't. You don't really see it. And also watching him, he's very focused on that three and D role. I'm also concerned about his ability to drive. Where, I there some scouts are really, uh, really like his ability because he uses the euro step well, and he also uses long strides to be able to, to be able to to shift his body and get himself over like a defender like jumping up to contest his shot so like if someone comes and jumps he can use he can use his ex, his la, his second step to kind of just shift himself away from the contest and make it my thing is he does it so often and he's so reliant on that long stride euro step that it becomes predictable and uh it was the same thing with like Josh Primo that I had that I had before before uh Primo got drafted where like he would do the Euro step so much. I think he was like one of the most blocked players in all of NCAA. But uh, obviously, he flashed way more potential in the combine games and stuff, which got him a really high draft pick. And uh, speaking about combine games, Keon Ellis did not have a good showing in combine games. The first scrimmage, he went one of four from the from three. I think one of five from the field, or something like that, with five points. Which or like two of five or something or two of six. I, he only he finished with five points and he did not put much and he did not show great three point shooting, twenty five percent. Not to mention he didn't get to play any that many minutes. He did show his potential to just hound opposing guards and just really put pressure on them, because he's, he he likes to get up in your face, up in your chest, and be more and be more physical. But 
yeah, like like you scouts still want to see see like potential on 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 the offensive end. They don't want you to be a zero on the offensive end, and they're still and and the defense is not so good to where it's like like I'm forgetting that guy from from Sacramento. It's like they, who went who was like a senior from Baylor and went like top ten. He's not. It's not like his defense is that good to where it's like okay, you can, even if his, um, scoring is like pretty much a zero, you can. You're still gonna be satisfied with his defense. Uh, his defense had to really evolve throughout the season as a senior. So, yeah, he's a senior, twenty two years old. So, he he doesn't have as much room to develop as other younger players. I will say though that. In these past few drafts, there have been a lot more older players getting drafted because, like, for one, if you're a 22 year old, you can still you you're still young, you can still develop. Like, it's not like you're 27 or 25, for for example. And two, also just so many of them be, were just so good, were just so good coming right out of college to where teams were like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'd rather take this experienced veteran. Even though he doesn't have the, that much room to grow, I still rather take him over like the raw, the raw nineteen-year-old with lots of potential because potential is very hit or miss, you know. And yeah, that's that's all I really have to say for Keon Ellis. I now I, I could probably I can go and make another video about his uh, three-point shoot, not his three-point, just his overall game, and just go more into it. But uh, yeah, I'll I'll think about it. Let me know what you guys think about this episode. I did it. I did cross 15 minutes. My bad, but hopefully you guys still got a lot from it. So I really appreciate everyone for tuning in. Shout out Roll Jack Roll on Twitter uh, for designing my new logo. Like I really appreciate it, Jack. That was really nice of you. So yeah, go follow him on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter. You know, or not really, because Twitter makes me angry. But whatever. Or it just makes me annoyed. What? But, anyways, yeah. Appreciate you guys tuning in. I'll catch y'all later. Peace.